Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 30. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now, hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. This is the word of the Lord. It's not supposed to be this way. We all uh, have had those thoughts, or maybe we've said it out loud when uh, violence hit our schools or when a natural disaster came through our country, or uh, when tragedy struck our community, we all know deep down inside of us that it's not supposed to be like this. I was thinking uh, a couple of weeks ago as I was preparing for this message, I was right around the time of September 11th, and I remember <clears throat> being a college student and waking up that morning and seeing uh, the violence that hit our country. And I remember thinking, it's not supposed to be like this. And for some of us, this is so personal. Uh, because uh, we are walking through a season of incredible suffering. Maybe we wake up in the middle of the night and we find ourselves uh, realizing that uh, we're still suffering with pain. We're still dealing with hard things since our, our spouse died a few years ago. Maybe some of us in here, this is so personal because we're literally in a season of chronic pain in our body. And we know that it's not supposed to be like this. Maybe some of us are watching our children who are grown uh, choose to live a life of addiction and we feel like it's not supposed to be like this. And we know that in this world, something deep down inside of us, we can just sense it's not supposed to be like this. But what if I were to tell you today what if I were to tell you that even in the midst of a world that has pain and suffering, that there is purpose in your pain? There's purpose in our pain. And today we're continuing on in a series that we've been in. Uh, we've been in two iterations of it. Uh, we're on the second iteration right now, and we're looking at uh, Paul's letter to a, a network of house churches. And in these past few weeks, uh, we've talked about how in Romans chapter 7, we see that Paul is identifying this idea that the law, the Old Testament law, uh, is actually really just a mirror. It shows us our deep need for a deliverer, for a savior. And, and Paul tells us his autobiography of how he could never quite follow the law. And he says, oh, what a wretched man I am. And yet, we see that as he comes to the end of Romans chapter 7, we see that he's, he says, man, thank God 
for Jesus, right? And then we get to Romans chapter 8, and he says there's no condemnation. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He says we have actually been adopted into God's family, that we are heirs just like Jesus. And this is the image that he has painted. This is what he has told us so far in Romans chapter 7 and chapter 8. And as we read and we came to the end of uh, Pastor Daniel's message a couple of weeks ago on Romans chapter 8, Paul says something that kind of stopped me in my tracks. Here's what he said two weeks ago in Romans chapter 8, verse 17, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Now, I don't know about y'all, but when I read this part of Romans chapter 8, I don't really like it because I don't really like to suffer, right? Does anybody here like to suffer? No, right? We don't like to suffer, right? I mean, I don't even like getting a shot. Some of y'all are going and getting an intentional IV. I don't know how y'all do that. We don't like to suffer. We don't like this idea that we may have to suffer. But Paul here, writing to these followers of Jesus in Rome who are definitely dealing with suffering, right? These followers of Jesus who are in this culture and they are suffering. And of course, Paul knew how to suffer too. He had been in prison. He had been beaten. We see in another letter that he wrote that he actually dealt with a thorn in the flesh. This brother knew about suffering and this brother knew about pain. But Paul also knew that not only is there purpose in our pain, not only is there a purpose in your pain today, but there is also strategy behind your suffering. There's a strategy, a divine strategy behind our suffering, right? That God is doing something, that there is a bigger purpose going on, that there is a divine purpose going on in our seasons of life where we are in pain. Some of us are dealing with this right now. Like our body is in chronic pain and we're going, I don't really like this. Welcome to the club, right? Some of us are dealing with seasons of life right now where we're finding ourselves suffering and Paul's saying there's something bigger going on here. You see, this is the theme of the text that we're reading today, that there's something bigger going on in our pain, something bigger going on in our suffering. These things actually work together. When we find ourselves saying, life is not supposed to be like this, that God just might be doing something more than we see on the surface. Because see, Paul knew this, that there was suffering in this life. And Jesus had told us, man, he said, there will be trouble in this world. But then we come to verse 18, and here's what he says, for I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. See, some of us right now, we're in the midst of this pain. Like this word is for us today. Some of us have found ourselves waking up at 3 a.m. and we found ourselves dealing with this heavy grief. We found ourselves dealing with this chronic pain in our body and we say, I'm ready to tap out. I don't know if I can do it anymore. This pain is too much. I can't handle this kind of grief. And Paul says, hold on, hold on, for I consider the sufferings in this present time no, 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 no. He says they're not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in the future. I want you to listen up. This is a word for some of you, some of you today. Nothing is lost in the kingdom of God. Nothing is lost in the kingdom of God. What you are walking through right now, Paul is writing this to this network of house churches. He's saying the suffering that you are going through, God's using it for a bigger purpose. There's purpose in our pain. There's a divine strategy behind our suffering and the things that we're walking through, they're just a fraction of the glory that will come to us one day. In other words, it won't always be like that. It, don't, it won't always be like this, right? It won't always be that way. There is a day ahead of us. There is a future day where Christ will come back, where we will be glorified. Those of us who love God, it won't always be like this. And Paul, of course, knew 
about suffering. And so he pivots. He pivots here and he, he, he begins to personify creation, right? He says creation, too, is frustrated. Creation is frustrated. Not only are you and I finding ourselves at times in life saying, man, it's not supposed to be like this, but creation, too, is saying that. Creation would say it's not supposed to be like this. Can you imagine if creation in Hawaii is frustrated? And if creation in the Rocky Mountains are frustrated, how frustration must be the Permian Basin creation be? I mean, I'll look around at the mesquite trees, and they must be so frustrated. Creation, too, is dealing with futility. Creation would say, it's not my fault. The mesquite bushes with the giant thorns would say, it's not my fault. The mosquitoes that were biting me like crazy, why is it still so hot in the Permian Basin? Come on, let's go. Let's get past this fall, you know, this crazy summer weather so the mosquitoes will go away. But the mosquitoes could say, it's not my fault. The hurricane could say, it's not my fault. It was all a part of the curse that we see in Genesis chapter three, that there are thorns and thistles in this world. It's not my fault. Hurricanes and haboobs, tornadoes and tempests, grass fires and group text messages. Let me just tell you. Some of y'all, you know who you are. I put you on mute and I don't feel bad about it at all. See, creation who is frustrated. Creation is literally in bondage, bound up like a slave. And in Romans chapter one, here's the problem. Paul says that some people are still worshiping the creation over the creator. People are worshiping the, the, the creation that's in futility, it's frustrated. And yet we see that it's not supposed to be like this. I love the way the N.T. Wright describes this. He says the plan had called for human beings to take their place under God and over the world, worshiping the creator and exercising glorious stewardship over the world. This is the way that it was supposed to be. And yet, here we are today, some of us finding ourselves in pain, finding ourselves in the midst of suffering. And Paul is painting this picture today. He's telling you that God's doing something bigger even in the midst of your pain, even in the midst of your suffering, even in the, in the midst of creation that feels like it's in futility. God's doing something in all of it. There's a bigger purpose behind our pain. See, in the meantime, though, Creation is groaning. This is the way that Paul describes it. It's this metaphor. He's personifying creation. He's saying creation is literally groaning like a woman having birth pains. Now, I love the way that he paints this picture. I love the metaphor that he's using here. I remember uh, when Allie was having birth pains uh, with our two daughters. I remember how even in the midst of the birth pains, we were looking forward to the child that was coming. But in the midst of those, those birth pains, man, she was dealing with pain. And I'm just here to tell you, ladies, we couldn't handle that, right? I mean, you know, like your husband, he gets uh, uh, cold and he's like balled up on the couch for three days, like it's the worst thing ever. But here Paul is saying that creation is, is literally groaning. It's this vivid metaphor, birth pains, anticipating the joy that will come when the child is there, but at the same time, creation is groaning in pain, literally, in a sense, suffering, longing for the day that it will not be stuck in futility. This is the same word, groaning, uh, that we find in Acts chapter 7, where, where Stephen is preaching, and, and we see that this is God actually speaking. He says, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their, say it with me, their groaning. They're groaning, and I have come down to deliver them, and now, come, I will send you to Egypt. It's this idea of deep grief. The creation is in deep grief. You and I, at times, are in deep grief 
pain. You and I find ourselves in the midst of seasons of life where the suffering feels like it's too much. Anybody in here ever felt like this before? Yes, lots of head nods, right? We all find ourselves in these seasons. If you're not in one right now, just wait for a few months. It'll probably come. Here's the good news in church today. And yet, I want to tell you today that there is purpose in your pain. That there is a divine strategy that God is using to conform you to his son, Jesus Christ, even in the midst of our suffering, even in the midst of our pain, even when we feel like it's not supposed to be like this. You see, Paul is telling us that creation is literally waiting. It's literally on its tiptoes. It's literally anticipating the day when the sons of God will be revealed. See, it's not always going to be like this. This is the good news, that one day that we will be glorified, those of us who love God. And because of this, our viewpoint should change. When it comes to suffering, when it comes to pain, those of us who are followers of Jesus change our viewpoint. We change when we're walking through hard seasons and we say, God, I know you're doing something in the midst of it. I don't even like it, but I know you're doing something in the midst of it. You see, God gives purpose to our pain. And God gives a divine strategy behind our suffering. In the same way that birth pains are a precursor, we see that Paul paints this other picture talking about how the Holy Spirit is just the first installment. Verse 23, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, we have the first fruits of the Spirit. We groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. The reason that you and I, when we see these uh, these awful images of what happens with the hurricane over uh, on the East Coast, the reason that we feel that things are not as they should be is because we have the Spirit, right? This is the reason when, when violence hits our schools, we say it's not supposed to be this way because we have the Spirit. This is what we see, right? We're not in this alone. When we're in the midst of our pain, when we're in the midst of our suffering, we're not In it alone. Look at what Paul says in verse 26. He says, likewise, the Spirit, say it with me, helps us in our weakness. Is this not good news? This is good news, friends. That the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, gets down into the mess with us into our painful seasons of life, into our suffering, right? For we do not, when we do not know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. This is what Jesus did when he came down into this world, when he left glory and he got down into the mess, hanging out with a bunch of sinful people. And guess what? The Spirit of God does it for us today. He gets down and he intercedes for us when we don't know how to pray. Anybody ever felt like, I want to pray, but I don't even know what to say right now? Yeah. So often when we see the hardest of the hard parts of life, we don't even know how to pray. And it says, but the Spirit praise with us because he is the spirit of God, our helper, our advocate, the one who gets down in the mess with us. And then I love what Paul says in verse 27. He says, and he who searches hearts, he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So creation groans. And at times, you and I groan in our weaknesses, in our pain, in our suffering, but also the Spirit of God groans with us and for us. I love the way that N.T. Wright describes this, this name of God, the the, the searcher of hearts. He He says it this way. It's like 
God is uh, kind of like Indiana Jones, right? And he's got his torch and he's looking around inside our heart because this is what God is most worried about, even in the midst of our pain, even in the midst of our suffering, that God is looking around in our heart into the, some of the deepest recesses of our heart. He's looking, he's listening, and here's what he's looking for, the groaning of the Holy Spirit when we're in the midst of our pain, when we're in the midst of the hardest, of the hard suffering in our life, that the Holy Spirit is in the mess with us. See, God is with us in our pain. And God is doing something in our suffering. See, for at times, we saw in verse 26, at times we don't know what to pray. But look what he says in verse 28. One of the most well-known passages in all of Romans, possibly in the whole entire Bible, for at times, in verse 26, we don't know what to pray, but in verse 28, and this is what we do know. This is what we do know, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. This is what we know, church that all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Think about the context of what Paul is writing about here. He's talking about suffering, he's talking about pain, and then he says all things work together for good. Do we see how so often when we put this verse on the back of a shirt and we just kind of move on, we miss it entirely, don't we? I mean, how many of us, let's be honest in church for a moment, how many of us, we just lost our job, and, uh, you know, this sweet old lady who comes up to us, and she's trying to be so kind, and she's like, hey, I know you just lost your job, and you're thinking, I just took like a $30,000 pay cut, and she's like, don't you worry, all things work together for good. <laughs> right? I mean, we've, we've had this happen. Or maybe uh, we had somebody else uh, who came up to us, students, you just broke up with Cutie McPretty, and she was perfect in every way. I mean, she was perfect in every way. And then, you know, sweet West West Texas woman comes up to us and says, when God closes a door, he opens a window, right? (laughs) Or is it the other way? I can't remember. You see, when we say all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose in this way, no, we're missing the point. It's such a superficial way of saying it. No, what he's saying is there's purpose in your pain. And there's there's a strategy behind our suffering. He's saying that he's in the mess with us, that God is doing something with us. He's doing something in us when we are dealing with the hardest parts of life. That he's conforming us to his son, but that he's helping us. If we go back to earlier in Romans chapter eight, he's talking about life in the spirit, that he's, he's cutting off and trimming off some of the things that need you know, trimming. He's doing something in us, in our pain, in our suffering. There's purpose in our pain, church. There's always purpose in our pain. There's always a divine strategy behind our suffering. God uses it to form us and to shape us and to mold us. And this brings us to the glory. This brings us to the glory where we see that this brings glory to God when you and I who love God are formed into the likeness of Jesus. How does he do this? Well, he goes back to what he was talking about earlier in the chapter. He's enlarging his family, that God is actually adopting us into his family. Those of us who love God, he's actually inviting us to be a part, shaping us and molding us and changing us. And we'll dive into this more in chapter 9. But then he comes to this passage in verse 29. He says, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. Let me just tell you, this is a passage that theologians and commentators and pastors have argued about for years. (laughs) 
But let me just tell you, this is not a passage that we can just close our eyes to and act like, I wish it wasn't there, right? See, what we see is God in his incredible sovereignty knows, or as Paul puts it, foreknew, and he predestined some to be conformed to the image of Christ. And we can't just skip over this passage, and it may be even a little bit uncomfortable for some of us that not all will be conformed to Christ, that not all will be conformed by his spirit in the spirit-led life that he talked about earlier in the chapter, but there is room, let me just tell you, there is room for free will and God's sovereignty, God's sovereignty in this passage. There is, there is room for predestination and yet also foreknowledge and free will in this passage. And we'll dive more into this in chapter nine, but there is mystery in this verse. There is mystery in how God's sovereignty works together with human responsibility. But I will tell you this, that in his foreknowledge, that God is doing something in this life, in the midst of our pain. That God is doing something in the midst of our suffering. God is always working things together for good. And those who he calls, he justifies. We talked about this already, that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And those who he justifies, we see they will also be glorified. And though things are not always right in this world, and though we deal with pain, and though we go through seasons of suffering, God is working all things together for good. See, Jesus Christ also suffered, but now he is glorified. I was thinking about uh, this passage a few weeks ago, and I was playing uh, with my seven-year-old daughter, Anna Claire, we were playing uh, with some modeling clay, and uh, she's like, Daddy, what are you gonna make? And I'm like, I don't know, I'm 44, right, you know? She's like making a frog, or she's making uh, some sort of animal, and I was like, well, I guess I'll I'll make a bowl, (laughs) because that's what my skill level is. And so I I grabbed the modeling clay, and I'm kinda, you know, starting to form it and mold it, and I begin to think about this last verse where it talks about being conformed to the likeness of God's son. That in the midst of the hardest parts of life, in the midst of the seasons of incredible suffering, in the midst of incredible seasons of pain, that God is actually using us to mold us and to shape us and to conform us, to make us look more and more like his son. And that even right now in the, in the season of pain that you're in, that if you begin to just change your perspective and you realize there's a purpose behind the pain that you're walking through, that there's a strategy behind your suffering that God might just change your perspective on how you suffer. And so today I wanna tell you, some of us are in that season of life right now. And I want you to begin to change your perspective. And so I want to pray for us today, for those of us who this message has resonated with so much, that God might be doing something greater in our life, that he might be using these seasons of life to change our perspective, that we can one day be conformed to the image of his son. So would you stand with me as we conclude our time? See, some of us are dealing with incredible pain. Maybe it's in our body. Maybe it's something that our family is walking through. Some of us in here today have suffered so much because of other uh, decisions that other people have made in our life. But I wanna tell you today that God has a purpose behind that pain. He has a divine strategy And today, I think he would say to you, let's change our perspective on it. And so if that's you today, if you say, God, I I wanna change my perspective on how I have dealt with this pain, how I have dealt with this suffering, I want you just, as a sign to God, just raise your hand, I wanna pray for you as we conclude our time today. Father, thank you. Thank you today, Lord, that we can come to you, that you're not afraid of our pain, you're not afraid of our suffering. In fact, 
The Holy Spirit gets down in the midst of it with us, prays for us with groaning too, too, with groanings too deep for words. Lord, today, I pray that you would shift our perspective. God, I pray that you would begin to give us a heavenly perspective, a perspective that you're doing far more in us than we can ever ask or imagine. And so, God, would you help us in the midst of this because you work all things together for good according to your call. In Jesus' name, amen.